I want to welcome everyone to the Tocqueville Center's Ernest J. Walters Jr. Memorial Lecture. My name is Brent Nelson, and I'm the interim director of the Tocqueville Center for the Study of Democracy and Society, and a professor in the Department of Politics and International Affairs. Let me just briefly uh, mention uh, Dr. Walters, who, uh, who this lecture is named after. Um, I, he was never my colleague exactly because um, we overlapped precisely. He walked out of his office and I walked into his office. And as he retired, I started as an assistant professor. So I did get to meet um, really what was a very famous professor at Furman. Uh, he was a political theorist, uh, studied at Chicago, um, was very serious about what he did and, and started a tradition that has really continued here at Furman. Uh, some very serious students of political theory um, under great professors. Uh, he was an interesting guy. He was funny in many ways. And um, I very much enjoyed the few opportunities I had to really talk to him. Even in, he even invited me to his home um, and uh, unfortunately, he passed away way too early after he retired. Um, his widow and his daughter often come, but they are not able to come tonight. So we still honor the memory of Dr. Walters and the great legacy that he has um, given Furman University. Now, the Tocqueville Center is dedicated to exploring the big questions that face every individual and every society. What does it mean to be human? How should we live? What is good government? Who makes and enforces the rules? These are just some of the questions asked by the best minds. And Alexis de Tocqueville, the 19th century French aristocrat, social scientist, philosopher, and politician, is one of those great minds. In his classic book, Democracy in America, Tocqueville asks many questions about how societies in the age of equality form and evolve. Part of his analysis concerns how we engage in activities that sustain our lives, how we conduct the business of making a living. And that is the aspect of Tocqueville's thought we will be addressing today. Tonight we will hear from Professor Jerry Z. Mueller and three panelists as they respond to his paper. But before I introduce the speaker for the evening, let me read, let me first read Furman's standards of comportment, which are required to be read before each CLP. This event is part of the university's cultural life program, which provides opportunities for students to participate in a variety of educational and enriching cultural experiences. Through these events, students encounter a spectrum of issues, ideas, opinions, and artistic expressions from various disciplines and cultures. CLPs invite meaningful dialogue, leading to a healthy understanding of and respect for differences. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of the university. All participants are expected to display respect for the presenters, performers, and audience members. Keep an open mind in the presence of new ideas and opinions and conduct themselves with civility. In turn, all presenters are also expected to encourage productive and responsible conversation consistent with the mission and values of the university. And by the end of this year, I will have memorized that. Um, and please silence your phones if you haven't already done so. Now to the main event. Jerry Z. Mueller is Professor Emeritus of History at the Catholic University of America. He earned a BA from Brandeis University and an MA, MPhil, and PhD from Columbia University. In the main, Professor Mueller is an intellectual historian with a very wide range. He is the author of seven books, including books on Hans Freyr, Adam Smith, Jacob Taubes, and Jews and Capitalism. He has published on conservatism and in probably his best-selling book, 
the tyranny of metrics. But his most important work, which has become, um, which is called The Mind and the Market, Capitalism in Modern European Thought, which was published in 19, I'm uh, sorry, in 2002, um, has become a classic. And I just want to show you my well-worn book, which I use every time I teach international political economy. I don't know how many times I've read the book. The different colors will tell you probably. But um, if you have never read it, you definitely need to read it. It is uh, a great uh, classic. So um, he also has done a 36-part th uh, series titled Thinking About Capitalism, available from the great courses. It's also a classic, and it is one that has made him absolutely famous in my household. The title of Professor Mueller's paper tonight is Tocqueville on Capitalism in America. It is a great honor to introduce to you a great scholar of our time, Professor Jerry Mueller. So thank you very much, Professor Nelson, for inviting me and for hosting me in what's been a, a lovely day on your really uh, remarkably beautiful campus. Those of you who see it day to day may not appreciate how spectacular it is, but it's been great to be here. I should also say beforehand that by and large, the views expressed here are those of Alexis de Tocqueville and not necessarily Jerry C. Mueller. <laughs> okay. In 1831, by the way, can you all hear me? Good, okay. In 1831, the young French aristocrat and aspiring politician, Alexis de Tocqueville, visited the United States for nine months. In 1835 and 1840, he published his two-volume work, Democracy in America, which would become a classic of social science and influence American self-understandings. De Tocqueville was not the first European to visit America looking for ideas about the probable future of Europe, nor was he the last, but he's remained the most famous, and for good reason. De Tocqueville's analysis has an uncanny quality about it. Though it was written almost two centuries ago, much of it still seems to contemporary readers to provide a recognizable portrait of the United States. And it's an ambivalent portrait one that reflects de Tocqueville's own ambivalences and about democracy in general and about American democracy in particular. Democracy in America is not typically regarded as a book about commerce or capitalism. I looked over the little Harvey Mansfield book that was in Dr. Nelson's office, a short introduction to Tocqueville, and I saw in the index there's no entry for capitalism or commerce. Um, uh, on the face of it, it's a book about democracy. But as we'll see, much of the book has to do with capitalism, at least with the forms of capitalism uh, that were taking place in the United States in the, 19th, in the 1830s when he visited. The Tocqueville's observations and analysis in democracy in America were informed not only by his own experiences traveling around the United States and his extensive reading in contemporary sources, but also by his reading of Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, and as we'll see, Adam Smith, the author of The Wealth of Nations. Because the Democracy in America is a long and rich book, and because it reflects the Tocqueville's ambivalences, it's been read and interpreted in many different ways. That, you might say, is what makes it a classic. De Tocqueville was a liberal who believed in the idea of equality before the law. That's a, above all what liberty meant in his period. And that's above all but what he meant by democracy. As de Tocqueville analyzes it, America, at least outside the South, was characterized by equality not in the sense of equality of wealth, but rather equality 
in the, but rather in the sense of equality of legal condition without the inherited hierarchies of European societies. Tocqueville thought that democracy in that sense was the wave of the future in Europe as well. He thought that this democratic revolution of equality before the law was an irresistible element of modern history. He visited America to see democracy in its most pristine form, undiluted by the traditional hierarchies of European society. And the portrait that emerge, emerges in democracy in America uh, is informed not only by de Tocqueville's hopes for the future, but by his attempt to provide a sober analysis of American democracy with its inherent advantages and flaws. In his book, in a book of 1948 called The American Political Tradition and the Men Who Made It, the great mid-century American historian Richard Hofstadter wrote that American democracy has been a, quote, a democracy in cupidity. I want to suggest that Hofstadter's characterization of the United States as a democracy in cupidity is very close to Tocqueville's own. Hofstadter's use of the term cupidity was a way of characterizing the pursuit of economic self-interest as a vice. Cupidity is a negative term. De Tocqueville didn't use the term cupidity precisely because he recognizes that the pursuit of material self-interest has its positive sides as well as its negative elements. De Tocqueville didn't use the term capitalism, wasn't in widespread use at the time, but he speaks of commerce and he uses related terms by which he means more or less what we've since come to call capitalism. Some of de Tocqueville's most striking observations about capitalism in the United States come where you might least expect it. Uh, in a chapter called, quote, it's a long title, Some Considerations Concerning the Present State and the Probable Future of the Three Races that Inhabit the Territory of the United States. That's the title of the chapter. It's the last chapter of volume one, and it's often less read today. The three races to which he refers are the Europeans, as he calls them, which are Americans, largely of British origin, the Indians, that is the indigenous peoples, and Negroes, those of African origin, either enslaved or free people of color. He characterizes the European Americans as, quote, a commercial people, unquote. And he draws a striking contrast between them and the Indians. Now, a little bit of background. In 18th century thought, in which, with which de Tocqueville was very familiar, in the work of Adam Smith, for example, there was a theory that classified societies into types. That is to say, a sort of model of different types of society. And the model was based on differing means of production and differing means of political organization and also of the character traits that each of these kinds of societies typically fostered. There was the stage of hunters who live by hunting animals and change their homes by following the animals that they hunt. There was the stage of shepherds or pastoralists, that is livestock herders who move with their flocks in a regular pattern. There was the stage of settled agriculture in which people live in one place and grow their own crops. And then there was the stage of commercial society, characterized by commerce, by manufacturing, and by more extensive government. The first two stages, the stages of nomadic hunters and shepherds, were sometimes termed barbarism. And the latter two, especially the stage of commercial society, was typically referred to as civilization. Now, it's important to keep in mind that Smith and others in the 18th century used these terms for classification and analysis, not for moral evaluation. They thought that there were characteristic character traits that were connected with each sort of society. In his discussion of the Indians, the Tocqueville comments that it's very hard for hunters to move into agriculture or commercial society because, and I quote, men who have tasted the idle and adventurous life of the hunter feel an almost insurmountable distaste 
for the constant disciplined labor required by agriculture or industry. End of quote. Though their, through their contact with the Europeans, he said, the Indians have acquired new tastes for firearms, for iron, for fabrics, for whiskey, but not the means of satisfying them. And it's difficult, he said, for them to adapt to this civilized, that is commercial, form of life. Worse yet, he writes, and I quote, it has been the misfortune of the Indians to come into contact with the most civilized, and I would add, the greediest people on earth at a time when they themselves, that is the Indians, are still half barbarous, end of quote. By the most civilized and greediest, Tocqueville uh, makes clear he means those British Americans. Now, note that for de Tocqueville, constant disciplined labor, working for the man nine to five, uh, is a characteristic of capitalist societies, a theme that would later be central to Max Weber's characterization of the spirit of capitalism. This idea of constant disciplined labor it isn't a natural or inevitable way of living one's life. It's identified with, a, it's the ethos of a certain kind of, of society. Early in uh, book one of the, ah, sorry. For, for de Tocqueville, attitudes towards constant discipline labor also distinguish the Euro-Americans of the North from those of the South. And this gives you some insights into his analysis of commerce as well. Uh, early in book one, Tocqueville introduces the theme of slavery as distinguishing the South from the North. Here's what he wrote. And here he's writing about the whites in a slave-owning society in the South. Slavery, he wrote, dishonors labor. It introduces idleness into society and with it ignorance and pride poverty and luxury. It saps the powers of the mind and lulls human activity to sleep. The influence of slavery combined with the English character explains the mores and social state of the South. Remember, he's talking about the whites now in the South. And he develops this theme in the chapter on the three races at the end of book one to which I referred earlier. The Tocqueville notes that in the states without slavery, that is to say, that the states without slavery, that is those in the north, are more prosperous than those in the south where slavery prevails. That's partly, de Tocqueville thinks, because free labor, he thinks, is more economically productive than slave labor. More importantly, for our purposes, is the fact that slavery versus free labor lead to different attitudes towards labor itself. In the South, labor is identified with slavery, so it is dishonored. That is to say, to say it's seen as a sign of inferiority. While in the North, labor is honored. Uh, as, he, as he puts it, in the North, the white applies his industriousness and intelligence to labor of every kind. Not so in the South. And here he makes an interesting comparison. Uh, he says, uh, like the hunters, that is the Indians, the slave owner is, quote, contemptuous, not only of labor, but of all enterprises that succeed in virtue of labor. Living in idle comfort, he has the tastes of idle men. Money has lost part of its value in his eyes. What he seeks is not so much fortune as excitement and pleasure, and to that end, he invests energy that his northern neighbor employs elsewhere. He has a passionate love of hunting and war. He enjoys the most violent forms of physical exercise. Think football, to be a bit anachronistic. He's familiar with the use of arms, and as a child, he learned to risk his life in single combat. Thus, slavery not only prevents the white from making a fortune, but diverts his will to other ends. He says, for two centuries, and this is still a quote from de Tocqueville, these factors tending in opposite directions have been constantly at work in the English colonies of North America. And they have led to a prodigious difference in the commercial abilities of Southerners and Northerners. Today, 
Only the North has ships, factories, railroads, and canals. So for de Tocqueville, commercial society or capitalism is based on, uh, when it's based on free labor of the sort found in the North, is characterized by greater energy and resourcefulness. The South, again to be a bit anachronistic, by hunting, football, and the military. Now, let me turn to de Tocqueville's broader reflections on American society as a whole. American society, as de Tocqueville saw it, was characterized above all by the search for well-being, understood largely in terms of material wealth. He writes, quote, men who live in democratic times have many passions, but most of their passions either culminate or originate in the love of wealth. This is an important point. This is not because their souls are pettier, but because money in such circumstances really is more important. Now, this was a profound point. In a traditional hierarchical society of status, like the old regime France into which, uh, from which de Tocqueville's family came, in that kind of a society, your status is determined largely by who you are. And who you are is determined largely by who your parents and ancestors were. While in the United States, and in every democratic society, insofar as it's democratic in the Tocqueville sense of, no, uh, of equality before the law, inherited status doesn't matter. So most social distinction is determined by wealth. One effect of the lack of inherited status in America is that people are, the Tocqueville says, is that people are more anxious about their status and they believe that they can change their status by getting richer. If you're ambitious in a dictatorship or in a monarchy, you might get ahead by serving the monarch or by flattering the dictator. If you're ambitious in an aristocratic society, you might try to become ennobled by military accomplishment. But in a democratic society, the main way to get ahead is by becoming richer. That's why de Tocqueville says the democratic society casts all ambition in a commercial mode. Now, it's essential to keep in mind that for de Tocqueville, the equality in democracy is not so much equality of possession as it is equality of the possibility of possession. The fact that this possibility exists means that if you're not rich, it's your own fault. And it's the very potential openness of all roles to all persons in a democratic society like the United States that creates what de Tocqueville frequently calls restlessness, perhaps the uh, quality of Americans that most struck de Tocqueville. One effect of all of this is to make Americans much more active and industrious in pursuit of bettering their condition. And it means that compared to Europeans, again, this is in the 1830s, but there's still some continuities, Americans have a different ethos, that is, a different valuation and characterization of character traits. So what Europeans chastise as love of gain or immoderate desire for wealth, Americans regard as praiseworthy industriousness. What Europeans regard as moderation of desire, Americans call faintness of heart. That's because, and this is a key point, in aristocratic societies, in these traditional societies, the rich take their material well-being for granted, while the poor can't aspire to greater material well-being. Indeed, they can't even imagine really being rich. But in America, de Tocqueville says, no one is guaranteed well-being in the way that the European aristocrats were. Well, at the same time, everyone can imagine it for themselves and aspire to it. Americans, as de Tocqueville describes them, are tormented by the goods that they do not possess. Or by the fear, he says, of not having chosen the shortest way of getting there. And the tragic irony is that the desire, as de Tocqueville sees it, is that the desire for improved material well-being grows 
even as it is fulfilled. That is, once one attains some degree of material well-being, one wants more of it. Among the Tocqueville's striking examples of this are people he met who left their original homes on the east coast of the United States to move to Ohio in an attempt to get richer, and then left the homes that they built in Ohio in search of better prospects in Illinois, that is further west, something that was really quite unimaginable in, in France at the time. Now, the fact that in America there is no legal privilege and that professions are open to all promotes ambition. And because all are striving for these positions, there's great competition. And in that competition, there are winners and there are losers. And therefore, many don't make it. And thus, ambition leads many people to a certain degree of dissatisfaction and disappointment, precisely because one could imagine succeeding and rising, but not everybody actually does, of course. This restless activity, according to de Tocqueville, is reflected in both political life and in commercial life. Moreover, the ethos of commerce spills over into politics with some positive effects. Here's, as, here's how de Tocqueville puts it. The passions that move Americans most deeply are commercial rather than political. Or perhaps it would be better to say that Americans take habits formed in trade and carry them over into the world of politics. They are fond of order, which business needs if it's to prosper. And in their mores, they particularly prize regularity, the foundation of any sound enterprise. So their desire for economic well-being leads them to value political stability. Among the greatest drawbacks of this capitalist democracy, de Tocqueville thought, was that as they get wrapped up in the search for personal wealth and well-being, people have a propensity to become isolated from one another. De Tocqueville calls this individualism. And it's a kind of self-concern pursued in a rational way. De Tocqueville defines individualism as, quote, a reflective and tranquil sentiment that disposes each citizen to cut himself off from the mass of his fellow men and withdraw into the circle of family and friends so that having created a little society for his own use, he gladly leaves the larger society to take care of itself." End of quote. Um, so de Tocqueville thinks that this leads to an exaggerated and perhaps dangerous privatizing of life. As conditions equalize, one finds more and more individuals who have acquired enough wealth to take care of themselves. These people, Tocqueville writes, quote, owe nothing to anyone. And in a sense, they expect nothing from anyone. They become accustomed to thinking of themselves always in isolation and are pleased to think that their fate lies entirely in their own hands. Thus, democracy leads him back to himself and threatens ultimately to imprison him altogether in the loneliness of his own heart." End of quote. I can't write like that. This has two effects. On the personal level, it creates a kind of loneliness. And on the collective level, it, it leads to a lack of civic virtue. That is, it leads to a lack of concern for the common good and, and uh, leads away from political involvement. Yet, de Tocqueville's portrait of America is one in which these intrinsic dangers of individualism are counteracted in a number of ways in America. He thought, for example, the one source of counteracting individualism was religion because it drew men away from short-term materialism by turning their attention to more long-range considerations of salvation and by preaching duties towards others reminding them that there's more to life than egoism and individualism. Then there's what de Tocqueville famously called the ideology of self-interest rightly understood. People in such a society think primarily in terms of self-interest, de Tocqueville said, and they're used to justifying everything in terms of self-interest. Paradoxically, he says, they often act in a way that's not self-interested. 
But even, that's altruistic. But even when they do, they explain it to themselves in terms of self-interest. You might say, they don't want to be taken for a sucker. Right? De Tocqueville says, if you want to get such people to act virtuously, you have to reason with them in terms of self-interest. Or to put it another way, in a society where everyone thinks in terms of self-interest, the question is how people will interpret self-interest. In America, de Tocqueville writes, even preachers of morality don't speak of virtue as beautiful, which is the traditional way of speaking about it, but as useful. That, uh, that understanding of self-interest in turn influences the nature of patriotism in a democratic capitalist society. Monarchy, Tocqueville says, is based on what he calls instinctive patriotism, acquired through tradition and habit. But modern commercial republics must be based on what he calls considered patriotism, in which people are committed to their country because they see it as serving their own interests. De Tocqueville thought that self-interest properly understood creates certain virtuous habits, not great virtues like courage and magnanimity, but important minor virtues, that is, character traits that also matter. He writes, the doctrine of self-interest rightly understood does not inspire self-sacrifice on a grand scale, but it does prompt small sacrifices every day. It creates citizens who are disciplined, temperate, moderate, prudent, and self-controlled. And it does not lead men directly to virtue by virtue, uh, by, uh, directly to virtue by way of the will. It gradually draws them to it by way of their habits. In other words, in a commercial society, you develop modes of conduct that are based on a certain amount of discipline, moderation, prudence, and self-control. It also, this, this individualism properly understood, the Tocqueville says, also leads Americans to associate with one another. In a famous chapter called How Americans Combat Individualism with the Doctrine of Self-Interest Properly Rightly Understood, the Tocqueville describes how self-interest rightly understood leads people to combine with others for their own advantage. And that experience leads to a balance between private and public interest by demonstrating to people how concern for the interest of others in the long run serves one's own interest. According to de Tocqueville, one important way in which the development of self-interest rightly understood occurs is through political involvement. Quote, when citizens are forced to concern themselves with public affairs, they are inevitably drawn beyond the sphere of their individual interests. And from time to time, their attention is diverted from themselves. As soon as common affairs are dealt with in common, each man sees that he's not as independent of his fellow men as he initially imagined, and that in order to obtain their support, he must often lend them his cooperation. And de Tocqueville thought that this kind of association was most uh, effectively expressed by participation in local affairs. He thought that this involvement in public affairs wouldn't occur if government takes over all functions or if men resign themselves to be ruled by others because it's more comfortable than the effort involved in political association. The great advantage that Americans had compared to the French, the Tocqueville says, was their propensity to form associations. For this knowledge of how to associate is what he calls the fundamental science that is needed in democratic societies. Now, the Tocqueville is often portrayed as a prophet of what we now call civil society, that is voluntary institutions that are outside of government and outside of market relations. But if we read Democracy in America with care, we see that by civil associations, he means both non-business associations like temperance clubs, uh, and, but also business associations. And he suggests that the habit of association is mutually reinforcing in politics and in the capitalist market. Association in business, such as forming partnerships, 
leads people to become familiar with the habits of associating. And that, in turn, facilitates political association. And conversely, he says, political association often develops economic associations in that the habits of cooperation learned in political association teaches people to engage, how to engage in joint ventures in business. So the Tocqueville therefore saw as Americans as engaged in a mutually reinforcing culture of political association and economic association. The society that Tocqueville described in the United States in the 1830s was made up primarily of small farmers, of merchants, of artisans and craftsmen. Though not yet an industrial society, it was in the early stages of becoming an industrial society. And towards the end of democracy in America, he expresses the fear that the development of industry that is of factory manufacture in the United States could lead to a new sort of polarization, new sort of aristocracy. Now de Tocqueville had learned from Adam Smith both about the economic advantages of the division of labor, that is of specialization, and the dangers posed by the division of labor to the humanity of the workers. He expressed the economic advantages that are taken, that are almost copied from the beginning of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, where Smith famously described the pin factory in which the task of making a pin is broken up into many parts and becomes much more efficient and people become much more productive as a result. De Tocqueville writes, it has been found that when a worker spends every day working on the same detail of a product, the finished article is produced more easily, more quickly, and more economically. These truths have been dimly recognized for a long time, but in recent years, they've been conclusively proven. That's a reference to the wealth of nations. The Tocqueville goes on to describe the psychic and cultural costs of the division of labor in terms that are largely a paraphrase of Adam Smith's analysis in book five of the wealth of nations, but with a twist of the Tocqueville's own. Here's the Tocqueville writing. He says, when an artisan devotes himself constantly and exclusively to the fabrication of a single article, he eventually develops a remarkable dexterity in doing that job. But at the same time, he loses the general faculty of applying his mind to the direction of the work. Every day he becomes more skillful and less industrious. And we may say of him that the man is degraded as the workman is perfected. What should we expect? This is still the Tocqueville. What should we expect of a man who has spent 20 years of his life making pinheads? And to what can he henceforth apply that powerful human intellect that has often stirred the world other than the search for the best way of making pinheads? When a worker has spent a considerable portion of his life this way, his thought inevitably revolves around the daily objects of his labor. His body acquires certain fixed habits that it cannot shed. In a word, he belongs not to himself any longer, but to the occupation he has chosen. Then de Tocqueville goes on, that's in Adam Smith, in different words. Then Smith goes on to make a point that Smith had not discussed. That's partly because de Tocqueville's writing 50 years later. While the workers are degraded by this industrial division of labor, the masters, that is the person who designs and owns and manages the factory, are actually raised intellectually by it because they need to know something about a wide range of things in order to succeed. And so de Tocqueville says, while the worker's mind contracts, the master's mind expands. Now here's de Tocqueville's logic. In a democracy, everything is open to everyone, uh, to, to anyone who can purchase it. Since status is not inherited and it's not guaranteed, people in search of status want to earn more to buy more things. The division of labor, that is factory work, makes it possible to produce more goods more cheaply so that more people can buy them. And that in turn 
means there's growing opportunity to make a profit by organizing production in ways that can produce more goods more efficiently. And that profit motive, in turn, draws smart and ambitious people into, the, into business, into the process of production of consumer goods. And some of those people become successful and now have the capital to invest in new enterprises. And because they're restless and ambitious, right, the fact that they made a profit on their first company doesn't mean that they're satisfied with that. They're always looking for more. Um, because they're restless and ambitious, they're not satisfied with their existing wealth, but rather they seek out new opportunities in which to invest. And over time, the Tocqueville says, these people become a new sort of quasi-aristocracy, culturally and even physically removed from the workers in their enterprises. But unlike the traditional European aristocracy, unlike the French aristocracy, they don't have the idea, the Tocqueville says, of noblesse oblige, that is, of, of the obligations toward their social inferiors. Nor, the Tocqueville says, do they have the sense of belonging to a common caste in the way that pre-capitalist aristocrats do. De Tocqueville was concerned that this could lead to new social polarization, uh, a pattern that was at odds with democracy and its promise of social mobility. For de Tocqueville, this social polarization was not a necessary or inevitable development. It was a possibility, a kind of dark cloud on the horizon of contemporary capitalism. So, to sum up the Tocqueville's analysis of America in the 1830s, capitalism, when based on free labor, is a tremendous source of dynamism in America. It has its intrinsic hazards, dangers, and drawbacks, but these can be mitigated by counteracting forces. It has come at a tremendous price to the indigenous inhabitants, the Indians. The absence of free labor in the South exacts a heavy price on the enslaved people of African origin, but it also saps the dynamism of their white masters. I hope you can see why democracy in America is open to so many interpretations. Also, why it pays, why it repays reading and rereading. Thank you. So I'll ask Professor Muller to take a seat, and I would like to welcome to our panel Professors Robert Larive, Jeffrey Yankow, and David Gandolfo. And as they come up here, I'd like to uh, give just a couple of words of introduction. Uh, they are nicely seated in order here. So um, Rob Larive is assistant professor in the Department of Politics and International Affairs here at Furman. He studied philosophy at the University of Winnipeg, which um, makes him a fellow countryman of uh, Pro Professor Mueller because he was also he's also from Canada, from Ontario. So we've got the Canadians up there. Um, he earned his PhD at the University of Notre Dame. He is a political theorist specializing in Islamic medieval political thought with a focus on Al-Farabi. Jeffrey Yankow is David C. Garrett, Jr., professor of economics at Furman. He earned his PhD from Ohio State. I took out the THE Ohio State because I am from Wisconsin and I'm a badger and we don't use the THE. We find it a little highfalutin. Uh, Dr. Yankow's extensive research agenda has focused on the pecuniary returns to geographic mobility, the effect of neighborhoods on work behavior, the patterns of job search among young workers, and why workers living in cities earn higher real wages. David Gandolfo is Associate Professor of Philosophy and Chair of the Poverty Studies Program at Furman University. He earned his PhD from Loyola University of Chicago. His research interests include economic ethics, liberation philosophy, international justice, 
and the responsibility of a university in the realm of social justice. Let's welcome our additional panelists. And I am going to try to move this back because I think it'll be better for people over here. I can almost see everybody over on the right, but um, I, I don't need to be seen. So uh, as we have uh, agreed, each panelist will now give a three to five minute response to Professor Mueller's paper, and then we will uh, have a panel discussion, and then we'll open it up to the audience. So Rob, please, and make sure it's turned on, yeah. Is that good? Yes. You hear me? Okay, great. great. Thank you very much for the paper and your presentation. I really enjoyed it. There are many, many ideas from Tocqueville, key concepts that are explained clearly in the paper and put together in a nice uh, logical arrangement. So I really appreciate it. It was very helpful to me. I have a question surrounding the restlessness of the American and materialism. So because we have more equal opportunities to acquire possessions, we feel a sort of restlessness. Around every corner, there could be another opportunity, and we want to grasp that without limitation. And we're restless because we want more and more, and when we get it, we want even more. And this leads to a phenomenon like competition against one another, and Tocque, or, yeah, Tocqueville even suggests d disgust and melancholy in the attempt to pursue more and more. And over time, it looks like it could be possible, he says, in some democracies that a form of materialism uh, takes hold of the nation and that our imaginations are geared towards opulence, possessions, and are filled with sort of material images. We're directed towards that, as well as being like cutthroat and competitive. Now, the checks against that are institutions such as religion, or self-interest rightly understood. As you point out, religion provides us with goals that are beyond just the material. And a thinking about like the long game, what's going to happen to our soul? rather than what will <laughs> happen the next day when we gather our possessions. Now, it seems to me that if commerce leads to a kind of materialism and religion's a check to materialism, is it possible that commerce will actually undermine religion over time, in which case one of the checks against it will slowly evaporate? And in addition, the spillover of commerce into politics, where we become, you know, the political order becomes more managed and rationally uh, structured, you'll have rulers that are so geared towards materialism as well as economic actors that the common good or these greater social relationships will also evaporate and unwind. So I'm just wondering what you think about the relationship between commerce and the possibility of materialism, which could undermine institutions like religion, which is supposed to check materialism and its deleterious effects. So just, I was thinking, you know, restlessness and religion and materialism are, you know, ideas I'd like to learn from you and hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think we were going to go down the line, but let's, uh, I think we should have a response. So if you could take that mic right there, Jerry, and pull it out and turn it on. No. There you go. This. Yeah, no, I think it. That, that's better. Yeah. Okay. Just keep it right to your mouth. Okay. So it's important to keep in mind, to put things in historical perspective, that this restlessness, this ambition, uh, for improving one's situation is, on the whole, much better than living in a society where you don't have the opportunity to improve your situation. And that's the 
that's the society in most times and places um, historically. So uh, one, one shouldn't underestimate the uh, virtues, uh, the advantages to people of living in a society in which they can improve their material situation. It's why most of our ancestors came to these shores, um, not all of them, some came in voluntarily, some came as religious refugees, but most came because they wanted to better their condition. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Um, in terms of, so de Tocqueville does think that materialism, a uh, term that he does uh, use, um, is, a, is an intrinsic danger of a democratic commercial society, uh, which as you say is, uh, there's all these, there the, but, but there's these countervailing forces. Um, we talked about religion. He also thinks that the family, and especially, now he's talking about the 1830s, especially the role of women in the family uh, as cultivating a set of um, uh, emotional relations that teach people uh, that there's more to life than just you. It's a point that Hegel also makes, by the way. Um, that, that, that's another important uh, countervailing force. He also thinks the fact that you have to, that people learn to associate for local matters, like where's this road gonna go? Or sh should we build a new road? Um, that also draws them out of themselves into some larger degree of public concern. So I would say that um, it's a constant tension in capitalist societies. Uh, uh, it's, constant, it's a constant tension between the values that are most characteristic of the market becoming sort of imperialistic and taking over other realms. Uh, it's a tension between that and there being other realms in which uh, there are countervailing forces, uh, in which people learn to um, uh, limit their expectations uh, or learn that there are other sources of satisfaction than just their material ones. Um, there's, you know, the poorest kind of person is the kind of person who thinks that there are no more satisfactions than material ones. There's a, there's a joke about a, a Wall Street trader who retired in his, ninth, in his 30s to spend more time with his possessions. Um, <laughs> and th th that's a very, I mean, that's a kind of, in, it's a caricature, obviously, um, and a lot of those people are actually very familiarly oriented and very generous, but it's a, it's a kind of caricature of uh, negative possibility. So, as for, as for politics being well managed, geez, I wish ours was. Uh, I'll leave it at that. So, Rob, pass it on to Jeff. And go for it. Yeah, so I have to say that this was pretty much my introduction to uh, the up, up closer. Yeah, the I have not spent much time reading him. In fact, I've never read him. And so <laughs> it was nice to, to read this paper. And the thing that I found most interesting, just for me personally, is uh, the fact that I recognized myself in many of the things you were describing. And unfortunately, oftentimes, it was probably some of the less flattering portraits that he was painting, but um, I found that to be uh, really, really interesting. Um, I, I'm just going to, to put my little two cents in with this idea of the restlessness. The thing that always comes to my mind to really capture that notion of restlessness for the everyday man usually is, I think, the obsession with kitchen counters. So I used to be a big fan of the Brady Bunch when I was growing up, and I always thought they had the coolest kitchen I've ever seen. Right? Get, get it, get it up closer. And it yeah. was uh, for Micah, I believe, for their countertop. But, you know, it was a real cool '70s looking thing. And all of a sudden, you get to the 1990s, and if you didn't get granite countertops, you just had it made it in the world. And so everybody had to have granite. If you didn't have granite, you just you know you weren't part of the modern world, and you were not successful. Then everybody had granite. And so the next thing everyone has to have is like, oh, I'm going to need quartz or I'm going to need marble. And 
And so that's the next thing. And so you're channeling this dissatisfaction or this restlessness into kind of armless things like that. So now you get the granite countertop replaced with marble, but then somebody else gets a marble backsplash and it's like, oh, that's <laughs> the next thing I'm going to have to have. And so what it, what it makes me think of is one of my favorite essays is um, Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, written by John Maynard Keynes. And he talked about how we, we're going to have this great productivity growth, and it's going to create such an opportunity for people to have more time to spend on meaningful things. <laughs> but if people can't get out of the way of their need for better countertops, um, they're not going to be in a position to take advantage of the abundance, and especially the abundance of leisure that, that um, has been created and could be created in even greater ways. And so um, my thought is, is they're just wondering if, if, if you have anything to say on this idea of if we could ever kind of, kind of break our way out of that mindset in such a way to appreciate some of the <coughs> Uh, well, we d we did upgrade from formica to granite a couple of years ago, and um, it does really work a lot better as well as looking nicer. Um, but more seriously, uh, look, one of the standard or recurrent critiques of capitalist society is that there, uh, you find this in people like Herbert Marcuse, you also find it in some of the encyclicals of uh, Pope John Paul II, um, that the, the capitalist society uh, includes people who are fostering new needs that then become perceived as wants. That is to say, things that you didn't know that you wanted, that is then that then becomes attractive. You because they become available, people tell you that they're av available, and so on. And the critique is that th that then could lead you to spend a lot of your time making money in ways that are not particularly fulfilling in and of themselves. Right? Um, so let me say a couple of things about that. First of all, that's true. That is a possible. I mean, capitalist society is made up of people trying to sell you stuff, much of some of which you don't need. And one of the roles of countervailing institutions in a well-functioning market society like families and universities is to teach you that not everything that people are trying to sell you are worth buying. Right? On the other hand, there's a lot of things that people are inventing and trying to sell you that are really culturally or mentally or spiritually enriching, um, in terms, not least in terms of one's leisure time. Um, we live in an age when you can watch almost all the great movies um, made in the history of the film industry uh, for about $20 a month on uh, the Criterion Channel. Uh, something that was unimaginable 50 years ago or even 30 years ago. That also affects the cultivation of one's children. My my children, who are some of whom are movie aficionados, um, show these great films to their children at home in a way that is mentally and culturally enriching. Uh, the fact that one has a, a, a cell a, a smartphone that can take photographs of wherever you are, that allow you to communicate with people, with friends or colleagues anywhere in the world almost for free, again, something that was unimaginable 30 years ago, and now you can do it, that reinforces one's cultural connections and one's familial relationships. So there are lots of things in the market that people are trying to sell you that you don't need and that aren't very good for you. And there's also new things that they're creating. They're creating because of the profit motive, because of that restlessness and ambition that provides really good stuff for us. Is this working now? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Muller. I really appreciated the paper. I second what Rob said, that uh, uh, it was 
very clearly written, which is I, I, I uh, love it when I get to the work of a scholar who takes the time to not only express ideas, but express them in a way that uh, non-specialists and students like myself and students can appreciate, uh, can grasp. Uh, so thank you for taking the time to do that. And I wanted to express uh, uh, to Professor Nelson uh, that, that I really uh, am uh, impressed with the uh, what he's done with the with this with the Tocqueville program this year, uh, and I, I, I appreciate that too. Um, I wanted to te spend my time uh, teasing out a thread towards the end of uh, Professor Miller's paper, um, uh, dealing with the chapter that he mentioned uh, uh, in Book Two, Chapter Twenty of uh, uh, Tocqueville's Democracy in America, entitled "How Aristocracy May Emerge from Industry." This chapter looks directly at the relationship between democracy and capitalism and points out the forces within capitalism that can compromise and even destroy democracy. At the op as the opening lines of the chapter put it, quote, I have shown how democracy favored the growth of industry, or what he means is capitalism. So I'm going I'm to use the word capitalism. He says, I have shown how democracy favored the, the growth of capitalism. We are now going to see by what indirect path Capitalism may indeed, in its turn, lead men back toward aristocracy, end quote. Professor Mueller discussed the ways democracy's assumption of fundamental equality, as opposed to aristocracy's assumption of strict hierarchy, incentivized risk-taking entrepreneurial behavior. That's Tocqueville's reasoning for how democracy fostered the growth of capitalism. This chapter then goes on to show how conditions created by capitalism can return us to the hierarchy of aristocracy, thereby erasing democracy. It's instructive to follow Tocqueville's argument because it gives us clues of what steps we might take within a capitalist economy if we want to preserve democracy. Tocqueville argues, as Professor Miller pointed out, that the profit motive drives the division of labor ever forward dividing production into smaller and smaller slices, squeezing the creativity out of the workers' tasks, and surrendering that creativity to managers. The result is that workers, after decades of uncreative work, are dumbed down while managers are enhanced. That sounds very harsh. That's the point that Tocqueville is making, that, that the, way, the way the profit motive has, has uh, driven capitalist production it tends to dumb down the workers and enhance the managers. Think of the production line. The task at any one station along the line has been simplified, optimizing efficiency. Not only is creativity not required, but to the extent that a worker tries to get creative, it just gums up the works. All of that creativity that is taken from the workers is surrendered to the managerial class, who not only designed the hyper-efficient workstation, but now have to coordinate thousands of workers making hundreds of thousands of products, including managing the complex supply lines that make sure those workers are never idle. But, it's not, but still, from this, so thus far, it's not clear, thus far in the argument, in Tocqueville's argument, it's not clear why, the way, why this way of organizing production is a threat to democracy. The way this mode of production becomes a threat to democracy has to do with the pay that these two groups, workers and managers, can command. One of the results of the hyperdivision of labor is that the worker becomes very easily replaceable since it takes little time to learn all that one needs to know for any given station along the assembly line. The manager, on the other hand, needs far longer to master what she needs to know in order to oversee the production line and oversee the supply, the, the supply lines. Easily replaceable workers have little leverage to use if they want higher wages, better benefits, safer working conditions. Managers have more leverage when negotiating their salaries, benefits, and working conditions. The end result is that managers are far wealthier than workers, and they use this wealth to build better, safer, healthier neighborhoods for themselves, better schools for their children, better after-school and summer school programs for their kids, better health care systems for them and their families. In other words, managers and workers end up leading very separate lives and know nothing about each other. And the children of managers grow up to be managers while the children of workers grow up to be workers. This is the reemergence of inherited aristocracy 
and therefore the death of democracy. This is what Tocqueville was worried about. The lack of class, the lack of class mobility is then nearly as strict as it was under feudalism with its nobility and peasantry. Tocqueville's analysis thus gives us clues as to how to avoid this situation if we want to preserve democracy while also enjoying the productivity of capitalism. Workers and their children must be able to live in decent, healthy, safe neighborhoods. They must have access to free, high-quality health care, free, high-quality education from preschool through university, including a full, a full spectrum of enriching after-school and summer programs for children that fosters their creativity and the growth of their intellect. In other words, while the wealth, dif wealth differential between managers and workers need not be zero, we must raise the floor and that may, of course, necessitate lowering the ceiling, in order to create substantially equal opportunities for children of these two groups. Without equality of opportunity, we end up with aristocracy. The challenge that Tocqueville's analysis leads us to is this. I'm sorry, leads us with, the challenge that Tocqueville's analysis leads us with is this. Do we value democracy enough to rein in the excesses of capitalism. The details of how to raise the floor are beyond what we can go into this evening, but it could include re-empowering labor unions, creating a universal healthcare system, fixing our broken public schools so that all children receive an excellent education, and augmenting those schools so that they include a full spectrum of excellent after school and summer programs for all children. That, that Tocqueville would support such programs might be gleaned from the fact that when he was in Parliament, he supported progressive taxation, wage increases, and other pro-labor measures. He did this as a way of undermining the appeal of socialism. Mm -hmm. In other words, he sought the humanization of capitalism as a way of making capitalism sustainable for the long haul. And ultimately, whether or not Tocqueville would support the education and healthcare programs proposed here, his analysis of the way unfettered capitalism leads to the death of, leads to the death of democracy argues that you and I should all support these programs. Thank you. Jerry? So um, let me take the opposite point of view, um, even though I agree with some things, but for argument's sake, let me take the opposite point of view. Um, so first of all, one of the effects of democracy understood in the Tocqueville sense, uh, sorry, understood not in the Tocqueville sense, but in the more common sense in which we use it, in the sense of everybody has uh, the possibility of playing a role in choosing their government through voting. Um, and, and Tocqueville does talk about that too. It's just not the strand of democracy that I focus on. It's not the strand that he's most interested in. Um, uh, that creates countervailing pressures uh, in and of itself if the situation um, uh, becomes, uh, becomes too difficult or too polarized or whatever, which is why in the long run, every capitalist democracy is to one degree or another a social democracy in the sense that over time incentive voting incentives develop uh, for government to try to um, uh, ease some of the burdens created in a um, capitalist society or some of the disadvantages. Not to eliminate them, but to ease some of the burdens. Um, in terms of creating equality of opportunity, let me give you the other side of the issue, which is quite brilliantly argued in a book by uh, Friedrich Hayek called The Mirage of Social Justice, which if you teach social justice, you really ought to use. Do you? Okay. Okay, so add this to your reading list. Um, one of the points that Hayek makes is that the attempt to create real, full equality of opportunity is a mirage. You can't do it. And it tends to have a kind of totalitarian direction. Here's why. He says, there's no substitute for a family that endows you with a certain amount of intelligence, 
culture, uh, habits, uh, and character traits that are conducive to successful living in a capitalist society. And to the extent that you want to substitute for that, you're going to take children more and more out of their families and put them in shared conditions. This was Plato's solution, after all. Uh, and so uh, government and other, and other social agencies end up uh, taking over or invading, as it were, the familial and personal realm. And frankly, a society where kids go to daycare, um, I mean, daycare is a perfectly good thing. It's often a very good thing. But it's not going to create the kind of equality of opportunity that comes from having parents who are intelligent. Not everybody has that. Sorry. Uh, who convey to you cultural and character habits that are conducive to self-control, industry, ambition, uh, what have you. Uh, and so there's a limit to equality of opportunity taken seriously. I'll, I'll let David respond to that, and then I want to hear Jeff, uh, our labor economist, um, add his two cents. I think that um, uh, while there may be limits to the extent that we, ch we can create equality of opportunity, we can go much further than we have gone in creating equality of opportunity. And it's precisely the, the, that, that aspect of democracy that Tocqueville is talking on, at least uh, is, is concerned about in, in the chapters that, um, uh, uh, that you are dealing with in the paper. And so that's why I focused on equality of opportunity. And uh, as I said, I, th I think it's, uh, uh, we can go much further in establishing the conditions of equality of opportunity. And if we were to uh, uh, kind of do the uh, uh, the reverse of Tocqueville's journeys. Tocqueville came to America to learn lessons for how Europe might, uh, uh, what, for what the future of Europe might look by look like. We can go to Europe for lessons about the uh, what the future of America might look like, uh, and learn from the uh, free, high quality healthcare, free, high quality educational systems that they have uh, in in uh, in Europe, and that which becomes the basis for. Uh, equality of opportunity. All of the society, if we look at uh, uh, um, economic mobility in all of the OECD countries, all the wealthy countries, um, all the countries in Europe all have greater economic mobility than we have, greater transitioning from, uh, from the lower ends of the economic spectrum to, to the higher ends. And it turns out that because once, you know, uh, an entrepreneur, an entrepreneurially entrepreneurially minded 16, 17, 18 year old wakes up and realizes that his or her uh, future is, depends on how, what they do and how hard they work. Once they have that awakening experience, if they have behind them a truly good education, and if they're healthy because they have behind them truly good health care, then, then there are much fewer obstacles in their way. But if at the time of that awakening that, that their future depends on their own uh, uh, on their own actions, uh, if at that point they have behind them a third-rate education, then there are many more obstacles for them to overcome in uh, attempting to, uh, uh, to go as far as, as, as their uh, labor can take them. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, granted, we can't, we, we can't tra uh, establish truly equal uh, opportunity, but we can go much further. And in fact, the children of the managers the ch children of the managerial classes, they're not being, they're, they're not spending more time in family. They're spending time in excellent after school programs. They're spending time in excellent summer programs. Uh, that is, exp that they're spending their time in all the programs that cut from the, get cut from the schools of poor children in the art programs, the theater programs, the dance programs, uh, because their parents recognize that that's needed for, uh, 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 the full development of of their 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 intellect and their personalities, um, and so I think we can go further in establishing truly equal uh, conditions of opportunity, which is uh, in Tocqueville's definition uh, democracy. So, thank you. 
So, Jeff, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I know you've done some work. Too and late. No, I too don't late. know about this. So. <laughs> I, too late. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know what to say with all of this. Uh, far be it for me to try to defend the American healthcare care system. Um, I did not design it. It's not the way I would have designed it uh, with employer-provided approaches like that. I, so I, I can't say anything on that. Um, public education, I, I don't know what to say on that. These, these are two areas where there is a lack of competition is what I can tell you, and usually bad things tend to happen uh, when, when, that, uh, when that is absent. But, um, but how about your work on cities, you know, yeah. uh, you know high-wage cities and geographical mobility yeah. and those kinds so, of things? So, what, <laughs> so there, there are two things, I guess, that, that I would try to, to put in place. Um, when Adam Smith talked about the division of labor, he did have this this section in all the way, you know, tucked in the back of, of uh, book five, where he talks about the alienation and the dumbing down of, of workers when you focus on just doing the one menial task over and over again, even though you get the great productivity gains. And so Tocqueville highlighted that potentiality, I think, the last time we thought seriously that that's really what's happening was like when Charlie Chaplin is making Modern Times, and that was like the 1920s. Mindless jobs have basically been replaced at this point. That was the other big part of Adam Smith, uh, how we talked about anything that could be taken down to a pure division of labor eventually would be replaced um, by labor-saving machinery, and that's one of the greatest things that have happened for us. I expect more of that to continue with both AI and robotics uh, moving uh, quite a pace these these past uh, 10 years or so. Um, things seem to be speeding up there. This offers a lot of great potential um, to generate a heck of a lot more income in this country. All income ultimately derives from production. And so anything that's gonna help in that area of production could create more opportunities for the types of things that David is is interested in. Um, he is, however, pointing out something else that has been happening in the labor market, and that's this idea of job polarization, hmm. which maybe for the past 20 years, this has been a new phenomenon where it's kind of, it's, it depends on who's doing the description of it. You may have heard it described as a hollowing out of the middle class in that we're creating a lot new jobs on the high end of the skill spectrum, a lot new jobs there, creating a lot of jobs on the low end of the skill spectrum, but not doing a great job creating new middle income type, type jobs. And as a result of that, the types of people who would have been in the middle have now had to slide down to the lower end and there's greater competition there and that's had a little bit of an impact on on wages. Um, the question for labor economists going forward is how, how long would something like that last? This is a recent phenomenon and it's, there's no guarantee that this is like a permanent state of affairs. So the jury is still out on exactly how much of a problem that would be. To a large extent, the way to solve the problem is something David was asking for, which is more high quality education. It's, it's to provide skills for workers because high skilled jobs are being created in abundance. We don't have enough people to actually work in those jobs at, at this point. So, so in a sense, we have a, a lid on, to, uh, on how many of those jobs that we're actually able to create because there's just simply not enough labor supply to fill the potential labor demand that, that uh, will be coming online uh, in the very near future. So yeah. I don't know what else no, I could good. add to that one. I, I actually think Adam Smith made that point, right? That education was one of the ways you could address the, uh, the yeah. difficulty so, so, of so uh, the, alienation. Yeah, so his, well, his concern, well, again, writing in 1776, his, his concern is you start working at age 8 or 10, and you're working 12 to 15 hour days, and of course, you're not gonna have any time to do anything, but work in the pin factory where you're focusing on this one little thing. Those types of jobs 
don't really exist. Right now, even on the low skill side of things, you have to use a lot of creativity with most of the jobs that you would be doing. The assembly line type of thing, um, the way David was describing the majority of that production line, that's all in other countries. Like when you go to visit the BMW plant and you look at the assembly lines there, that is not mindless work. There is problem solving, there's creativity that needs to be done, and your point is great. So Adam Smith suggested, well look, if we're really worried about people being so dumbed down with just their job, then provide education, literacy, give them opportunities for exercising their mind. And the big thing that's happened in the market is, well, now we don't work as much as we have in the past. So people don't start working at the age of 10. Right now, you know, it's, it's like age 18 and, and much later oftentimes. And the average work week in the United States is about 34 hours right now. I mean, I don't even know if Adam Smith could even have imagined that that would be a possibility, that you could feed your population by working a 34-hour work week. And so the opportunities for, for exercising your mind are there for just about anyone. And I think that's what Professor Muller was bringing up with the idea of the classic movies that are now available to anyone at a really, really low cost. And so um, that's what I would, would say with that. Okay, well, thank you. Well, let's get the audience involved here. And I do believe that there is a uh, roving mic somewhere. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the first question to Will over here, right down here, Chris. And do introduce yourself and then ask your question. Turn, is it turned on? No? Um, so I'm pushing back on the idea that no low-skill jobs exist today in America. Um, as someone who worked full-time at a warehouse this past summer, I can assure you they do. My job, eight hours a day with a one-hour break, was taping boxes. The light would go on, I would, take the I would tape the box, and I would put it on the conveyor belt. This was at a warehouse distribution center, which is a very large industry in America. Also, I want to push back on what Dr. Mueller said about um, the facade of social justice and um, the state encroaching in the personal and family domains. Um, I would argue that the market has already done that. Uh, we see it in um, daycare where, you know, Families are divided because no one can stay home and the child has to, both parents need to work. Or, um, you know, mothers have to shorten their maternity leave because, you know, I mean, well, there is no guaranteed maternity leave in America. Um, these, the incentives of capitalism is to not provide these things to people. Um, and I think we, as we can see today, um, it has been successful in denying American families uh, those things. Okay, thanks, Will. Why don't you pass the mic over to Noah over here, and then I'll get one more question. We'll get all three out there, and then we'll have the panel uh, Can respond. I ask Will a quick question? Yeah. Will, that job that you had in the warehouse of picking things off shelves and putting them in boxes, right? Is, is that what you described? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Do you think that job will still exist 10 years from now? Yes. Really? Yes. Why? It sounds like something easily mechanized. Okay. Okay, good. Noah. Hi, if you don't know me, I'm Noah. I'm a student here at Furman. Thank you, the panelists. Thank you, Dr. Moller, for being here. There are, there, are, there are a couple things I want to touch on. The remarks about like labor and what you mentioned about your, your job experience and the mentions about the 
need for higher skill education to fill more jobs and create more jobs and seems to address the recent labor incentives and moves to strike. We've seen it at the UAW plant and other plants. But what I want to touch on really is the comments about like the allusion to the kitchen countertops and how like things, some things like, for example, like there are like trendy items that not everything is worth buying, but there seem to be like a movement to buy trendy things, anything or trendy things anyway, or do, or do trendy things anyway. And I feel like that trendiness has been amplified greatly by social media, especially with outlets like Instagram and TikTok being so influential these days. And we've also seen the undermining of the institutions talked about, like families or whatever. Well, in like, we feel that the undermining of churches, there's like less emphasis placed on like churches, for instance, and other countervailing institutions. Given the trendiness factor that has been on the rise and will be on the rise, and the undermining of countervailing institutions like the church, and in, in, with the implication for families and other things, what lessons might Tocqueville offer about that? Okay, and we have one more down here. Yes? Yep. Yeah, and then we'll let the panel uh, respond, and we'll be done. Thank you. Thank you all. It was um, really instructive listening to you all and learning from you. Um, I have a concern. Right up in, in I have a concern that um, education is not being taught by educated people, public education, and that um, so that when when you I, can, I don't remember your name, but when you suggest more um, education, I'm very concerned about the teachers who are not educated. And I'm also concerned about education um, teachers taking away from parents rights that parents ought to have, that parents have traditionally had. And, um, you know, there's lots of data that shows that the two-parent family is the most significant factor in creating people who lead successful lives. And I don't see that being a factor that's being talked about at all. Um, I think more, more after school programs are great. But you know, Johnson in the 70s created the Great Society, supposedly, and I don't think it had any impact that has improved our society. Lots of money went into all kinds of social programs. I think of the kind that the gentleman on my right is speaking about, and I think we're still facing the same problems. I think that what needs to happen, from my experience, <clears throat> it is the parents. If they are, if a, if a child is lucky enough to have parents who are intelligent, even if they're both working, providing lots of educational opportunities for their children by teaching them mm -hmm. and teaching them good values, good work habits, that you end up having more successful children grow up. Okay. Um, and it is not, yeah. it is not really, now how, we, I, th I, th I think government is actually undermining the, um, the two parent family. Okay. Thank you, I think we've got three. I'm gonna give Jerry the last word here because we have 30 seconds left. So you, you have the last word with the microphone right there. Okay, so, so two things then. Um, so here's what we can really learn from the Tocqueville. Um, don't be an ideologue if there's some social or political system that you're looking at. Try to be conscious and aware of the advantages that it offers and some of the intrinsic drawbacks. And rather than denying the drawbacks, think about them and think about how they might be alleviated, not eliminated at the price of the productive system that makes the whole thing possible, but 
But um, don't be an ideologue, either a pro-market or an anti-market ideologue, and, and, and think about how markets, capitalism, changes over time, changes possibility, creates new hazards, creates tremendous new possibilities for people. Um, I think actually that's the most important thing to learn from de Tocqueville, though you could learn it from a lot of other people too. In terms of family in the market, which is a subject I'm particularly interested in and have taught about for a long time, um, the market responds to people, uh, the market both influences people's um, families and responds in some ways to people's um, familial priorities. Now it responds more when, they, when you have tight labor markets, uh, either at the high end of the labor market or the low end of the labor market, the more competition there is um, for workers, be it high level professionals or be it people working in, a, in, a, in an Amazon factory, um, the more leverage those people are going to have to make market conditions more suit their own concerns. So take, for example, the issue of unpredictable time schedules, right? Which is one of the worst things in terms of family life for parents, right? Um, there's now, now, because we have a tighter labor market, um, big employers uh, from, uh, you know, McDonald's to, um, to uh, CVS or whatever, are giving people more predictable schedules, which itself is, is important in terms of reconciling familial life. It's true at the top of the labor market too. Claudia Golden the other day won the Nobel Prize for Economics. If you read her most recent book, which has to do with professional women and the family over the last three generations, she shows how uh, women's changing, changing preferences, professional women, to try to increasingly combine familial life with professional life has created incentives for law firms, accounting firms, big companies, and so on, to create both work schedules and professional ladders that make it more possible for women to have children and raise them in professional settings. So again, all that's possible because there's competition there for talented people among capitalist competitors. Okay. So I leave it at that. Thank you, thank you. So as we wrap up this evening, let me invite you to, the, to next month's Tocqueville Center event, which is on the topic, The Black Experience in America. Now let's show our appreciation to our speakers and you are dismissed.